It's also what occurs when you've been watching way too many Ultra series in such a short time span. Kaijunokame from the Toko and Animation News Network, and today I'm going to be taking a look at Mill Creek's DVD release of Ultraman Max. You have three months to give us a new Ultraman show, is practically what TBS told Tsuburaya Productions after the cancellation of Nexus. As such, Tsuburaya was put into a tight spot as Nexus had been a financial disaster, costing the company tons of money. To make matters worse, Tsuburaya had just lost two presidents during that time, as Masahiro Tsuburaya was fired for sexual harassment claims, while Hideaki Tsuburaya lost his position over Nexus's failure. This put the company into maximum overdrive, as they had to scramble to come up with a name and concept for the next installment. Their creative juices would have to be up to max power. This is when Shigeki Oyama was named the new president of the company, who decided the next Ultra series would have no movies or tie-in specials, so maximum efficiency could be focused on the television schedule. Another decision he made was that the next show would be limited to 39 episodes, with the majority of it being episodic as opposed to narrative-based, so that anyone can tune into any episode and enjoy it without having seen what came before. Initially, the next show was plotted as being a direct sequel to the original Ultraman series, ignoring all that came after it with having the old SSSP characters training a new generation of heroes. Oyama didn't feel the team could pull this off with maximum effort, so he rejected this notion. Then, the decision was made to just copy what the original show had done, but keep it set in its own universe with a new Ultraman in history. Thus, Ultraman Max was born. Piggybacking on the idea of doing a direct sequel to the original series, Susumu Kurobe, Hiroki Sakurai, and Masanari Nihei were all hired on to play leadership roles of the new Defense Force. Kurobe was Kenzo Tomioka, the supreme officer of the Defense Force's Japanese branch. <laughs> Sakurai portrayed the team's monster ecologist, Yukari Yoshinaga. The recently deceased Nihei only appeared in a handful of episodes as one of UDF's chief scientists named Date. Furthermore, Koji Murasugu showed up in an episode playing an archaeologist while giving us a nice little callback to his time as Ultra 7. UDF With all this star power and callbacks to the Showa era, surely Ultraman Max is the ultimate Ultraman experience, right? Let's find out. The Heroes. Harkening back to the original show, Max forms a bomb with rookie Kaito Toma to help protect the world from vicious threats. Kaito, played by Sota Oyama, lost his parents in an accident when he was a kid. His tragedy encouraged him to join the Defense Action Squad Heroes, or DASH, to try and prevent anyone else from experiencing a similar scenario. He will often dedicate time to helping an orphanage and easily becomes Max's ideal candidate to form a symbiotic relationship with. <laughs> Kaito always believes in putting others over himself, even before he became a member of Dash, as he demonstrated when he rescued a female Dash pilot from death during the world's first public monster encounter. This 
bravery earned him a spot on the Dash team and in Mizuki Koshikawa's heart. From then on, we get to see how the two develop feelings for each other over the course of the series, even though neither party is willing to admit their love to one another. It is interesting to see a relationship blossom between the two characters right from the start. On the other hand, it does become a tad obnoxious because Kaito and Mizuki are pretty much the only characters who do much of anything throughout the entire show. They are the only two who ever really get sent out on missions, which makes it seem like the other members of Dash are just incompetent. Mizuki is headstrong and willing to put her safety on the line for others, which is why she has great chemistry with Kaito. She also loves to troll! There is even one moment where Dash's android operator calculates Mizuki's life expectancy based on her recklessness in battle, and Mizuki demands to know what it is without hesitation. Well, she's not exactly wrong. I kind of lost track of how many times she would have been dead had Max not caught her plane from crashing. Those of you who have watched Ultraman G may recognize actress Hitomi Hasabe, for she played Lito's wife there. I can't help but laugh at Mizuki's Dash uniform, as it looks like it is two sizes too big for her. Oh, and they do something oddball with her at the tail end of the show that made me think of Minami from Ultraman Ace. Fortunately, it is executed much better better here. Back to Kaito, he transforms into Max using a wand-like device called the Max Spark, which looks similar to the ones used to the original Ultraman and Tiga. Max's design is quite reminiscent of Ultra 7's, from the way the silver stripes are laid out along his sides, to the chest armor, and obviously the look of his head. He even has his own blade attack. Unlike Seven, he retains the standard 3 minute time limit trope that Ultraman is known for. He does obtain an upgraded weapon that attaches to his wrist, courtesy of Ultraman Xenon, who is pretty much the Zolfi of this series. He shows up once and then leaves. The new weapon just gives Max an arrow like attack, but it can only be limited in how often Max can use it due to the amount of energy it requires. Max fights like your typical ultra hero with the occasional epic fail. The other members of Dash include Shigeru Hijikata, Kenjiro Koba, and Sean White. Hijikata is the team's captain who apparently hates rock music. Okay, Boomer. He will pretend to be domineering towards his subordinates, only for this to be a ruse as he has complete faith in his team's decision making. He will even outright disobey Tomioka's orders if he knows his team is in the right. <laughs> On the other hand, he can often be an idiot. Koba is Dash's top-notch shooter, who rarely ever has a chance to prove his worth outside of a few moments in the show's entirety. It isn't until the last several episodes when he is given much to work with. Sean 
Sean White's role is just as bad, whose sole purpose to exist seems to be to spell random phrases in English because having a white dude on the team makes it feel international. Seriously, Sean is hailed as this great scientist for the team, but we hardly ever see him in action. There was only one episode in the first half where we got to see him work hard for a moment, and that was it until later on. All three actors, Kai Shishido, Nobuyuki Ogawa, and Sean Nichols can only do so much with what they were given with. Shishido has appeared in other Ultra series including Ultra Q Dark Fantasy and the Jeed movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gaba played a couple of Grongi and Kamen Rider Kuga. Nichols is the English voice for Ultraman Chuck. I'm okay, but. The aforementioned Android of Dash is named Ellie, played by Hikari Mitsushima. Mitsushima kicked off her career as Belvira in the second Rebirth of Mothra film, while also going on to play Light Sister in the Death Note movies. Yuka Sawada in Kamen Rider Denno, and many other film and TV roles include award-winning performances. Ellie is, well as I said early on, an android. Her sole purpose is to sit at a computer console and keep an eye out for any oddities that may be occurring around Japan and calculate solutions to those problems. Her programming often leads her to misunderstand human ingenuity, having to be told by several of her cohorts that her statistics will not always be correct. She does start to understand how the human mind and heart works and will attempt to add those into her calculations, even if she is not always successful as was the case with her conversation with Mizuki about her demise. My favorite moment with Ellie is when she goes into what is called active mode. Makes me think of the android from Jason X. Dash utilizes your typical ultra themed vehicles, especially planes that are used to be shot down all the time. I mean, to confront enemies. Yes, that's it. Gotcha! I did like how they receive a new plane from Date, who does not want it to be called Dashbird 3. Yeah, that's Dashbird 3. And Ado 3 is completely kimeru da. Kura. This one also has an underwater mode to traverse the depths of the ocean. While it was cool to see a trio of actors from the original Ultraman show have reoccurring roles here, I really liked the inclusion of Kenji Sahara in one episode who was next to one of my favorite Sentai actors, the ever lovable magnet priest Kappa Soichiro Akaboshi. Additionally, Ipe's actor from Ultra Q makes an appearance in an Ultra Q based episode to reunite with Sahara and Sakurai. We also get to see the Gamma Trilogy's Ayako Fujitani and Yukijiro Hotaru make an appearance. もしまだ
伝説の石だ Finally, Hurricane Blues Now Nagasawa plays a ninja. The Monsters and Aliens. Ultraman Max was the first Ultra series to feature a return of old threats, on top of providing the audience with brand new ones. Ultraman Max pretty much set the standard for what we have today in the Ultra franchise. Many old favorites return, including the Balton. <laughs> Gomera so It's alive Zetan Antlar Ella King Pigmon Red King And so on. I do think King Joe had a downgrade, however, as the legs and waist separate in the middle vertically as opposed to being their own ships. Given Max's episodic nature, there isn't a main threat to be had in this show. Instead, we are just treated to a bunch of Aliens Monsters of the Week plot, with the final villain being nothing more than a typical weekly threat. It is disappointing as they show up out of nowhere without any build up at all, leaving me lukewarm about their significance. They might have made an impact if they had actually been hinted at earlier in the series. There are other creatures who do show up more than once, like one who takes on the human guise of a portly gentleman and hands out business cards while farting on buildings in monster form. Aww. We've got Shiro Kanzaki and Kamarader Zolda portraying a race of alien mercenaries. That's actually really cool, as are their alien forms. A really kick-ass looking dragon that must have been difficult to operate when he was flying. And a monster who shares the same taste in music as Hijikata. The effects and music. Outside of the occasional dodgy CGI sequence, Max's effects work is hands down the best thing about the show. The music's not too bad either. The miniature work, camera work, and fights are a constant plus. Music time. I really like this shot here with its color filter to give it an eerie feel. Hi. 
The night battles are a treat to watch, especially when fire is used as seen here. The sound effects are stellar and I can never get enough of hearing this. I also enjoyed one episode that was paying homage to Ultra Q and had a few moments filmed in black and white. The two episodes that Kyo Jisoji directed should come to no surprise when it comes to its cinematography, even if they are not Max's best. There was a lot of talent working on the filming of this show. Gamera and GMK Shusuke Kaneko directed a batch of episodes, as did Takashi Miike, which is why it looks so pretty. Too bad I cannot say the same for the writing, but I'll get to that in the next section of the review. The music was scored by Kuniaki Hashima, who I had previously talked about as doing the music for Kamen Rider Kabuto and Shibuya 15. As with Kabuto, Hashima's score is just as powerful here as it was there. Many scenes are enhanced due to his musical genius. <laughs> I do feel his work for Kabuto was stronger. There is no closing song, but unlike with Nexus, Max features a single opening theme simply titled Ultraman Max. Project DMM from Cosmos and Nexus returned to sing this song, which is one of my least favorite Ultraman openings thus far. I just find the music to be quite a bore to listen to, which may be why I find the vast majority of Max itself to be a bland show. The Episodes As mentioned earlier, Ultraman Max was written to be an episodic series, and man, is it a bore for doing just that. I know I had issues with Cosmos for its length, but its character development and constant returns to previous stories from the show helped it to be an enjoyable one. Nexus, for all of its flaws, benefited from that serialized nature as it felt fresh. Max, on the other hand, just feels like a typical been there, done that ultra series. I was bored out of my mind more often than not. Yes, there are quite a few truly high quality episodes. Yes, I had fun with moments. Nevertheless, in the long run, this was a slow moving, generic, by the book show. Character development is minimal at best. It wanted to be a show a show without the evolutionary steps Ultraman made. I will give the show credit for one thing though, it's basically the beta test so the final version, maybe is can succeed. Learning about its hectic production schedule explains so much as to why this show was as basic as can be. I had several contenders for my least favorite episode, but I am giving that honor to the untargeted town. You must be thinking you misheard me say this was my least favorite episode, given it was directed by Akio Jisoji and is a sequel to the Metron episode from Ultra 7, which I praised to high hell. Nope, you did hear me right. I hated this episode. It is a beautiful looking episode from a production standpoint. It has an excellent soundtrack to follow it. The sunset tussle at the end is gorgeous. The sunset tussle at the end is gorgeous. 
何よりの土産だなつべこべ言うんじゃない So, why do I hate this one over, say, the obnoxiously silly one about a monster who drifts through the sky? Cloudos, Caxay, and Muket, and Tainai, so say, Mitsu, to Gajo, so, to Wakaru, you need to cry. Tsumari, Meo, Samas, to Omokuna, de Ochimas. What? Or the two parter with the Balton where our main cast seems to be completely written out of character? It's also an episode that has an officer telling a child strange things like alien monsters don't exist even though they clearly do? Congratulations, Ultraman! You now have a Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue moment. A monster came out and grabbed my mommy. Now you know, dear, there's no such thing as monsters. It's because of what I had just said a moment ago. The Untargeted Town is written to be a direct sequel to the Ultra 7 story, The Targeted Town. After being sliced in half by Seven's blade, stopping the poison cigarette plant, the Metron is found by a father and son and nursed back to health. The son grew up to be a detective and hides the existence of his Metron buddy from the law, even when cell phone signals are causing people to go crazy, just like the cigarettes did back then. <laughs> This episode would have worked exceptionally well in Mabius, but not here. Why? Because the first episode established that monsters and aliens had never been seen before. Because Dash is the first group ever created to deal with monsters and aliens. Because Ultraman Max is the first time an Ultraman had been witnessed by modern civilization. However, by establishing this episode as a sequel to the Ultra 7 one, that means everything we were told in the premiere was a lie. Ultra Guard existed. Ultra 7 existed. Monsters and aliens existed beforehand. And that all of these would be known to people. <laughs> I have been looking forward to this episode ever since I saw images of it from my new type the live back in 2005, not knowing it completely spat over Max's established continuity, which made it the biggest disappointment of the entire show for me. To end this section on a positive note, let's talk about my favorite episode, or episodes because I cannot decide which I like better, Who Am I or The Stolen Max Spark. Who Am I is one of the episodes directed by Takashi Miike, which is interesting because I'm not really a fan of his movies. This is an episode the show sorely needed because it broke the formula of Ultraman Max. It kicks off talking about a girl who loved to draw, losing her sight, she had to find comfort in music, a giant marshmallow appears and in attacking it, it takes on the form of a monster which ravages the city. works on the creature as it is invincible. Even Max is powerless to stop it, leaving everything to the blind little girl and her flute. <laughs> the effects are just incredible. <laughs> As is the music. The pacing is a bit weird, but I'm willing to overlook that for this powerful story. The stolen Ultra Spark features the return of Ella King and it is done in a weird way. A man is found unconscious as if his energy is being drained from his body, keeping him in a coma with a baby Ella King that looks like a tiny xenomorph next to him. <laughs> hey,
Mizuki is taken under control of the Ella King and starts to assist it while two alien pits plan to leave the planet. The lighting is exceptional. <laughs> The soundtrack is musically blissful. Ah. And the camera work is equally enduring. Both of these episodes took everything I love about Ultraman and amped it up, creating unique experiences that I wish were saved for the superior sequel. The DVD. By this point, you know the drill. Cover. Spine. Backside. Discs in trays. And a booklet that talks about Max and the equipment, shows off the monsters, and then episode descriptions. Even with its shorter episode length, the show is still spread across six discs, leaving a 6-7-6-7-6-7 episode count, which was a nice break from Cosmos's nine episodes on a disc. Compression is not as noticeable, and the audio continues to be immersive despite the lossiness of DVD. The subtitles are a vast improvement over those for Cosmos and Nexus, though that does not mean they are perfect. There were still grammatical errors every now and then. <laughs> The biggest annoyance was for some reason we had a couple of times where Sean's dialogue would appear in a huge font. What's equally confusing about this is these words were spoken in English, which did not require translations at all. The opening theme was subbed, however, the episode previews and the monster data stuff after it were not. <laughs> If there is one thing I can say Ultraman Max excelled at, it is maximum boredom. It is just so monotonous and generic. Its few highlights sprinkled throughout is what ultimately saves Max from getting anything lower than a 3 out of 5 grown-ups in spandex. This show is eclipsed by having two superior bookends that there is very little to offer. From dumb comments about monsters and aliens not existing to an episode that completely wrecks continuity, there is a lot I disliked about this show. This one is for diehard Ultraman fans only. All others go in with low expectations. Until next time, bye.